Sweet and sour like a lily coy. Oh, my joy. Like smoke rising from the fire. Taking me higher. I must be strong. I must rely on the Father. An independent daughter needs a strong, courageous mother. And now I know. Paula Funga is not a household name yet. But this local girl who showed up at the auditions for American Idol wearing a t-shirt reading Big Girls Rock and who was named the Nahoku Hanohano Most Promising Artist of the Year is making a name for herself. Aloha no and welcome to Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Something you should know right off the top about this 28-year-old rising local star. She knows what it's like to be a child living in a tent homeless on a beach and helping others is part of who she is. Paula's last name is spelled F-U-G-A and it's pronounced Funga. Uh -huh. Well, let's talk about this wonderful honor you've received. You won the Nahoku Hanohano Most Promising Artist of the Year. Well, I think it's such an honor and I was up for three awards and that is the award that I wanted the most because it says that you know, hey, congratulations, we recognize you. We also know that there's more in store for you. And it's such a wonderful honor. And I've always imagined myself being a part of the Hokus and, you know, a part of the Hawaii Academy of Recording Artists. You know, there's such a buzz about you that you're the new face of Hawaiian music. And uh, one of the best musicians in Hawaii, Matt Kattengoob, the conductor of the Honolulu Symphony Pops, what he said about you was tremendous. He said, your voice is unforgettable and it's sweet and soulful. Would you agree with that assessment? Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I try to be humble, so I don't really like to talk, like, you know, too much about myself, like, in a good way. I mean, I, it's typically Hawaiian to not talk, you know, not sing your own praises, but, you know, I'm just very blessed you know, I I know I have something special, a gift that I was given. And well, now, when did you know you had this gift? How old were you when you figured out, I've got, my voice will rock? I was probably about four. Really? So you all, I, But you always thought you had something that would take you forward. Yeah. I, I, I think I really knew for sure what I would be when I was about nine years old. Someone asked me, Paula, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it was an adult that wasn't very supportive of, you know, like, wasn't very positive. So I, I stopped for a moment and I looked away and I looked up and I saw myself on a stage in front of a huge audience that I couldn't number. And I was holding a microphone and there was this whitish blue light shining on me. And I, I knew in my heart it was, to be a singer, you know. But I turned and I said, a teacher, yeah. just to kind of protect the dream. And and yet how many young women and young men have said, I'm gonna be a star one day, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a powerful voice and I'm gonna have my own album. Mm -hmm. And, and it, of course it hasn't come to be, but here you are. Yeah, well, it took a lot of time. I was in high school and I entered, different contests like Brown Bags of Stardom and Kiki Stars, which is the children's version of Hawaii Stars. And, um, you know, I just always knew what I wanted to do. I didn't quite know how to go about pursuing that dream, but I would do just little things. Like in high school, I took ukulele lessons from Roy Sakuma. And it wasn't to be this fantastic ukulele player. It was just so that I'd have an instrument to play while I tried to write songs or so I could sing, sing along to it. And, um, you know, just little steps here and there. I um, called the radio station and I asked, I said, you know, how do you get voice lessons or something? And, 
you know, like I, w- I listened to the radio stations a lot and I would call up and enter all these contests and whatnot and just pay attention to the music scene in Hawaii. And yet much of the time your childhood was was not the, uh, the typical suburban neighborhood childhood. You were living on the beach for part of your life and in foster homes for another part. Yeah, I lived on the beach a couple of times and um, I was in foster care but I think the fortunate thing for me is that my foster parents were my grandparents. And so I was really lucky f- that I got to be placed with family. And that's when I really started getting active in different programs is when I lived with them in foster care. And, um, you know, I just feel really blessed for, you know, the things that did come my way. When you were living on Waimanalo Beach, what was it like? Did you feel deprived? Did you think, you know, how come I can't live in a house like the other kids? Or how come I don't have the newest things? Anything like that? No, not really, because before I lived on the beach, I was living with um, aunts and my grandparents. But we just miss, my sister and I, we just miss my mom so much that we didn't care about living in a house we didn't it didn't seem like you know a burden or anything to live on the beach because you come home and it's like there's the ocean you know you get to go swimming and play with all these kids you know like i didn't i didn't think there was anything wrong only when we were teased about it that's about it paula remembers raking pine cones away from the tents so her family wouldn't step on their sharp edges Part of childhood spent homeless, now singled out as the most promising artist of the year by the Hawaii Academy of Recording Artists. Stay with us for more with local girl Paula Funga. PBSHawaii.org is your online resource for program schedules and information on PBS shows and local productions. Log on and connect to Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox to download transcripts from this and all episodes. Get online and get interactive at PBSHawaii.org. Welcome back to Long Story Short. We're talking with Paula Funga, who is the Hoku Award-winning Most Promising Artist of the Year. Now, you've talked about being homeless and going through different housing situations. Usually, that's enough to take away a kid's confidence, but you thought, you always thought you had a gift that you would take to the world and be successful with. Yeah, you know, and I, I think as in, when I was in intermediate, my intermediate years, I started to realize what was going on like in my life and in you know comparison to the world you know and I started to realize that you know the life that I was experiencing at that point wasn't the life that I had to have forever you know what I'm saying I knew that I would grow up one day and I knew that I be able to make my own choices and I thought this is really truly what I thought I thought you know yeah when I grow up and I have a family I'm never gonna let this happen to my kids you know what I'm saying and that was kind of the thing that made me choose to do right you know I chose not to drink and party in high school or you know things like that well, did it just a little choice well, yeah, there were kids that drank and, you know, smoked pakalolo and whatnot in school. And, you know, I stayed away from that kind of thing. And it's just, and then in college, you know, friends, I, I've, I knew some friends and they started getting into cocaine. And 
I, I would write these letters and telling my friend, hey, you know, one day I want to grow old with you and I want to have our kids play, you know, at the park on a Sunday or something like that. And how are you going to do any of that if you're not here, you know, if you're like strung up on drugs and stuff like that. And I, I would tell him, hey, you know, I know where this leads and it doesn't lead to a beautiful place, you know what I'm saying? What and was their reaction? Did they say, okay, good point, Paula, point taken or? Well, I'm a crier, so they they kind of just listen to me and console me. They're consoling me now and I'm like <laughs> serious about it. And I, th I think, I'd like to think that I help them, you know? Because now, like, that friend in particular, he's not doing drugs. He's doing very well. He lives in on the mainland. He's working and, you know, has a good life now. And I, I hope that what I said had a part in his decision to, to stop, you know. So your life as a child was an example to you in a negative fashion. You, you, you realize that's not what I want. I want the opposite of that and you, you struck oh, yeah. out for that? Oh, definitely. I was very fortunate to have positive adult role models in my life, namely my grandparents, my aunties. They were positive role models to me, you know, growing up and having cousins that, you know, they had high standards. And I lived on the beach. My mom did drugs. She cruised around with a lot of people who, made poor choices like stealing was acceptable and i remember in the i was in the car with my grandma one day one night and we're at the old gems in kaneohe and i guess there was it was a rena center or something like that and we're s sitting right outside of the window and i'm looking at all these big screen tvs and couches and what stereo systems and i remember i told my grandma i said Yup, if I had a truck and a brick, oh, <laughs> I could load up my truck with all this stuff and, you know, and my grandma turned around, she goes, she looks at me, she goes, what are you thinking about? Like, where is your mind? Like, that's stealing, that's wrong. What is, what's the matter with you? You know, don't you know any better? And she, she scolded me and I was like, whoa. Like, wow, I was just kind of thinking out loud, you know, and, I realized at that moment, like, wow, all of the things that were acceptable to me is not acceptable to the world, you know what I mean? It's like not a good thing to be a stealer, you know what I mean? And I had to learn that, but it's a trip because, you know, I feel, I feel so fortunate to have had those people in my life that set me straight, you know, and said no that's not okay that's unacceptable you know and it must have been very hard seeing your mom and other uh people you knew and cared about do things that weren't you knew weren't right but you still loved them oh yeah and it must have been kind of delicate for the other members of your family to say don't do that but you know of course that's your family it was kind of a trip um that part was kind of hidden from the other side of my family, you know what I mean? And it's like things that were done without them knowing about it. My grandma didn't know that, you know, we're around people who like, they stole cars, you know, and we, I went joyriding in those cars. I was like 12 or 13 years old riding the back roads. You were and, keeping the secret? Yeah, like we kept that a secret from the other side of our family. And there was a, a rule for a while, and I don't know why I listened, because I'm real Kalohe, mm -hmm. but there was a rule that said I couldn't cross the highway to see my grandparents, because my mom was afraid that if we went over, because we're not gonna lie, you know, and our grandparents ask us, hey, what's going on at your house? We'll tell them, you know? And so she was very adamant about us not going over, and to this day, I, I don't understand why I listened, you know? Like, I should have went across the street, you know, but. What if you hadn't had your grandma and these people who really cared about you and told you that's not right? I mean, you think, because uh, there are other children in your position who may not have had those connections. Oh. <laughs> if, 
If I never, I don't know where I would be, quite honestly. You know, you say you stayed away from alcohol and drugs when you were in high school because you saw where that path would lead you. But, you know, it's, it's a cliche. People who, who, uh, who get successful in entertainment, they have all kinds of um, opportunities and temptations and pressures. And do you see yourself ever taking that turn? Never. I don't ever see myself taking that turn. And what happened was I had to learn to hate it Hate it with a passion, too, you know. A passion that comes from a childhood filled with struggles from an artist whose album is named for the passion fruit, Lily Koi. Paula Funga, a fresh new face on Hawaii's music scene, a long way from a tent and the pine cones scattered on Waimanalo Beach. She's already performed with Jack Johnson and is scheduled to perform with Sheryl Crow. Get interactive with Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Log on to pbshawaii.org and connect to Long Story Short to see who's scheduled to appear in upcoming episodes. Submit questions for them and submit suggestions for future guests. Get involved and get interactive with pbshawaii.org. We're back on Long Story Short with Paula Funga. And if you're not familiar with her name yet, I think you're going to hear it in many years to come. Most promising artist as chosen by the Nahoku Hanohano judges. Wow. <laughs> and you're also a composer. Yes, I'm a, well, kind of. I write songs. Can you talk about maybe one of the songs you've done and explain how, you came, how it came about? Sure. Um, let me think. I guess I can talk about this one song. I, I started to write it and um, I didn't have any, I didn't have any music to it, for instance. And um, I had this melody in my head and so I started singing this mel this the words and it ended up being a song about love and I found myself writing about that and, um, I was like, what, man, I don't, I'm not even in love with anybody. How am I going to write this song? And so I thought to myself, why don't I write this song and imagine how it feels to be in love, you know? I'll just imagine what it feels like. And so I wrote, and um, it's called Sweet Reverie. It's track number 11 on my album, and it's so wonderful. I got to perform it with the Honolulu Symphony in August. And um, it's just beautiful. And I imagined strings in the song. And so for the arrangement on my album, we hired some you know, musicians and they came a string quartet and they played strings on my album. And it's just so beautiful. And it's, you know, all these years later, I've fallen in love and it's exactly how I thought I would it's feel. It's exactly as you imagined it? Yeah. Wow, who are you in love with? I'm in love with this beautiful plumber <laughs> from the North I've Shore. I've never heard a plumber described as beautiful. <laughs> well, you never met my boyfriend. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just joking. But yeah, and um, he's older than me, and he lives in Pupukea, and he's a really good person, and I feel really blessed to, you know, have found the one that I love, and you know. Do you feel like your life's an open book or are there places you really want to protect inside? 
there are certain places that I want to protect just because I'm not comfortable with talking about things like that yet. And I do, I know that there will be a time and a place for certain things in my life to come out into the open. And I think that, you know, it'll happen in its own time for its own purposes. But, you know, it's like, sometimes things happen and they're too hard to deal with. And for instance, um, for a long time, I've, as you mentioned, like I write my songs, my own songs. Um, I would write about love, all love songs, you know? And I think the reason I couldn't write about what happened to my life, what happened in my life, you know, is because it was too close still, you know what I mean? And too, too painful to talk about. So you would write about what you wished would happen rather than what had happened. Even though you think perhaps that, you know, some of the things you've been through would are the makings of wonderful songs that really touch people. Yeah, and I think that when it when I'm far enough removed from the situation in my life in my heart, I think I'll be able to write about it. You know what I mean? Yep. Good point. Perspective. Yeah. You know, um, so many people who describe your voice say it's powerful. I mean, you, you there's a core in you, and your voice is powerful. Where does the power come from? It I comes from my heart. <laughs> Truly, I, if I sing a song, um, say it's a cover, a song that I never wrote, I'll listen to the song, and I'll listen to the words, and the emotion that the song was written with, I can tap into that. And I think it comes from being empathetic too. Um, I think that that's one of my greatest gifts is having empathy. And I think that's something that the world lacks a lot of, you know, consideration. Hey, imagine how you would feel if someone were to do this to you, you know what I mean? And so when I sing, I try to use that and I, try to tap into the emotion that the song was written with. I'm still working on, you know, um, controlling my voice. I'm still working on learning how to use my voice to its maximum potential. Because I have a powerful voice, it takes a lot out of me when I sing. And um, so I'm trying to find that balance, you know, like, to find the highs and the lows and, um, you know, try to project emotion in even the pronunciation of words in my songs. How do you think, how do you think your next album, whenever you're ready to do it, will differ from the first? I think it's going to be a lot more bluesy because, um, I really like blues and it's a natural progression in me, you know. I love like old soulful music and I think that um, the songs that I'm writing right now are more um, bluesy, I guess you could say. And I just think that, I think my next album is going to be a lot deeper too, you know. And I think that this first album's given me the courage to speak up a little more, you know, and not only sing of love. I mean, love is like the most beautiful thing. It's the thing that, um, you know, joins people together, you know, and it's important, but there are other things that are important too, you know. And so I kind of want to write more about those things, things that maybe I was ashamed or scared to sing about before or write about. And um, I'm also writing a book right now. And um, my poems are a lot deeper than my songs. Just because songs, you have to sing them, you know? But poems, you don't have to sing them. And you can write whatever you want and be as raw as you, you can. And you don't have to worry about having to speak it, you know. You can just write it in a, on a piece of paper, and that's good enough. 
Well, we're looking forward to hearing you go deep in albums and poetry and looking forward to hearing from you in the future in, in any way you choose to express yourself. Thank you so much, Leslie, for having me on your show. And Thank you, Paula. Good luck to you with all of your other interesting interviews. Thank you so Thank much you. for sitting with us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. The expressive Paula Funga, 28 years old with a powerful voice and a powerful message. She's establishing a nonprofit organization called the Lily Koi Foundation to benefit women who, like Paula, have had to struggle. Mahalo for joining me for another episode of Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. Destruction of civilization has its consequence of every fashion the air you breathe comes directly from trees. What goes on must come back now, what goes around comes back around the things you do. Shall be done unto you. Sometimes it's hard to ease my mind to realize you're always with me. In my whole life, I've um, grown up hearing um, Fuga. So when I introduce you know, myself, sometimes I say Fuga, but it's really Funga. And I just learned what it means. What does it mean? It means flower blossom. Do you like that meaning? Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's your grandma's name? Tell us. Give her credit. My grandma's name is Judy Spencer. From Waimanalo. Yep. That's her nickname. Her real name is Hiltrudis. <laughs> That's my name. My middle name is Hiltrudis. Oh, named after her. And it means. It's derived from Judith, which comes from Judah, and Judah means praise. So um, my first name means little in Spanish. So it's um, little praise flower blossom. <laughs> can I just call you little? <laughs> you can call me flower blossom. <laughs>